So my name is Art Dohler. Uh, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I work for a company called Avature. We do software consulting. I am a software engineer. I am not a psychologist or a neurologist. I'm a dev like most of you. Uh, I just happen to really like brains. Because frankly, they're the hardest part of what we do, especially the ones sitting between our own ears. But I have a co-host today who is not on the stage, really, although he is. Uh, his name is Noodles. He is my system one, what Daniel Kahneman calls my system one. He is my intuitive, associative, unconscious self. That is to be differentiated from my system two, which is more what we call the conscious, linear, logical self. I tend to think of my system one as a hyperactive border collie. That's kind of how Noodles came to be. And Noodles is really helpful, but he causes some issues. He likes to help out, but the way he's trained just doesn't always work with the way that the world kind of works around us. And so today, we're going to try and learn some stuff about learning. We're going to learn about how to make noodles and the brain, your brain, learn things. And I'm going to try and convince you of three facts. First off, you don't learn like you think you do. And second off, what we call learning is really a bunch of different mechanisms happening inside of your brain. And lastly, in this might be the hardest one. Feeling discomfort and strain is actually good for you. And fortunately, because I'm me, we're going to have some real practical applications at the end of this, things you can actually do, take home. So most people's personal history with learning looks a lot like this. It's a classroom. It's a structured environment where there is pedagogical learning. You're, you know, facts being taught at you, and then intermittently there are tests or quizzes to kind of reinforce that learning. And then after the semester, or after the year, it all completely goes away. Well, more or less. But learning's really a lot more than that. We learn every day. We learn constantly. It's really, the thing that differentiates us from a lot of other species is the way that we learn and the, just the degree to which we learn. So when I sat down and started to try and work on this talk, I was like, great, first thing I'm going to talk about is learning types, which, to be honest, is where a lot of people go with this stuff. So let's talk about learning types. The first thing I did, I'm like, great, let's go to Google, because that's what you do in you know, 2018 is start plugging things into Google and just see where that takes you. And I got a bunch of different stuff. So let's talk about learning types. Do you want the three learning types? How about the four learning types? There are the seven learning types, or the eight learning types. And this one really looks like somebody's just trying to sell me something. <laughs> the intrapersonal learning. What I found out is really that the weight of the evidence is against learning styles. They're not a thing. There's some meta studies, some narrative, some literature reviews, rather, that talk about studies on learning studies or learning styles. And this study says the appropriate design was used in only about 20%, 20 studies. And the results of most of those was compellingly negative. They said they found three appropriately designed studies that yielded a positive finding. And they're not very convincing. There was a different, entirely different study that said there's a multitude of inventories and models for assessing learning styles. Most of them just aren't reliable. And then they kind of took it another step and said, hey, can we turn around and say, maybe these things aren't efficacious in a classroom. Maybe they don't work. We shouldn't be using them. But do they even exist? And they said, we can't even really find evidence for that. Really, when we think about learning styles and we think that we learn in a particular way, what it really is is that we're learning in ways that are comfortable and familiar to us. We find ways that work for us, and then we just get better at those particular types of things. That can lead to some problems, which I'll get into later. So let's figure out how we actually learn. I'm going to talk about these really fancy things called theories of action. This is from two researchers called Argus and Schoen. Anybody heard of them? No? That's OK. I read really stupidly obscure books. But they talk about these things called theory of actions, which it's essentially this set of assumptions that we have and these actions that we can perform in order to achieve a goal. And then. Alongside of those, we have these governing variables, these constraints that we operate under when we're using our particular theory of action. Because I am a huge nerd, I like to think about these things in math terms. It's an equation. It's a multivariate equation. 
we have these particulars of action performance, right? The eight, the three, the 2.2, they're changing how we're doing the action. We have the actions themselves, the variables. We're trying to reach this particular goal. And we might have some governing variables, some things that constrain the actions that we can do or the ways that we can do those actions. So that kind of leads to the question, how do we change those theories of action? Well, it happens in two ways. First off, we have these slight incremental improvements through implicit memory, neuroplasticity, and myelination, which are all topics we'll get into later. But the point is that these are tiny incremental improvements that are happening almost unconsciously, or explicitly unconsciously in some cases. The other way we change these are these huge conscious changes that brought on by dilemmas. When our theories stop working, and they stop working badly enough that we realize something is wrong, we have to consciously look at them and change them. Argus and Schoen break this down into what they call single loop learning and double loop learning. Now single loop learning is when we take the theory of action and that results in the actions we choose. And then we get some results and we take the results from that and we feed it back into the actions we choose. It's a basic feedback system, it's control systems, engineering, yay. A good example of a single loop system is a human stoking a fire for heat. If it gets too cold, you just go stoke the fire, it starts generating more embers, get more oxygen in it, and it burns hotter. In the math example, what we're doing is we're taking the results from one equation set and we're adjusting things. We're changing the way we perform these actions, but we're not really changing anything huge about the actions themselves. Double loop learning, on the other hand, means that we take those results and don't only let it affect the actions we're choosing, but we actually change the theory of action itself. We change the way we think things work, the way we believe that the world works. An example of that is a human and a thermostat and a furnace or air conditioner, which is you know, what everybody's got in their house. That thermostat's gonna keep that heating and air conditioning unit at a particular temperature. If you decide you don't like that, if that feedback comes to you and you're like, it's too warm in here, I'm gonna drop that temperature some. That's you adjusting that top level. In the math example, what we're doing is we're allowing that feedback to the theory to come around and adjust the entire way we're doing things. As you can see, the equation gets crazier, but that's because we've let that feedback affect us. So, pro tip for learning number one. Try and consciously evaluate those theories of action in a double loop style. And you could do that by being able to describe your theories. What do you believe is true? What do you believe is gonna happen? If you can, try things that are gonna actually disprove those assumptions. That'll help you get around the nasty thing called confirmation bias, which I could spend an entire hour talking about just on itself. Another thing you can do is actually kind of go TDD style when you're building a theory. Set things out, say, I believe this will happen. This is what I'm gonna do to test it. Okay, I do the thing, did that happen or not? Break these things down into small bits so you can try and consciously evaluate those theories of action as you're doing things. But when it comes down to it, what starts to matter the most is whether the knowledge that you're building through these theories of action is explicit, implicit, or tacit, which, great. What's tacit knowledge? Well, you know, I've got some time, so let's sit back. It's time to talk about theories of knowledge. No, we're not gonna talk about theories of knowledge. It's really boring. Believe me, I spent Argus and Schoen's book, the most I ever made in one sitting was 14 pages. And that was when I was trapped on a plane flight that was three and a half hours long. It was just like keep flipping backward, keep flipping forward, scribbling notes in the margins. Ugh. That's why I do this, I help you. I suffer for your sake. But let's break down those types of knowledge, right? We talk about explicit knowledge first. Explicit knowledge is knowledge that can be readily articulated, codified, accessed, and verbalized. What I'm dispensing to you right now is explicit knowledge. Tacit knowledge, on the other hand, is at the extreme other end of the scale. It's knowledge that can't be articulated or codified. It can only be gained through experience or maybe watching somebody else perform the task. Think about riding a bike. That's tacit knowledge. I remember my dad trying to teach me how to ride a bike and he's just like, pedal, just pedal faster. And I'm like, that's not helping at all. That doesn't explain the balance that, yeah. That's tacit knowledge. It's knowledge you can't really explain to somebody. 
Then kind of in the middle of that, you've got implicit knowledge. It's knowledge that's not explicit, but it could be articulated with effort. You're not thinking about it while it happens, but you, if you sat down and thought about it, you could explain what's going on. You can kind of layer these things into a delicious three-color layer cake and describe how things flow between them because there's a natural flow between explicit into implicit. As you do things, your body, your brain, start to take that off of your hands. It takes it away from the conscious self, that system two, and puts it more in system one's hands. Think about like driving to work. How many people have ever been in a car and you get to work and you're like, wait a minute, I was just at my house. That's what's happening. That knowledge, that process is becoming implicit. And eventually, over time, it will become tacit and becomes what we call muscle memory. Have you ever tried to type half your password or in, like, start in the middle of your password? It's really hard. Your fingers don't understand what you're doing because that knowledge is no longer explicit. It's buried elsewhere in your brain. On the other hand, though, pulling knowledge up from tacit into implicit is almost impossible without a lot of deep effort. And it's really hard to pull things from implicit up into tacit. So learning loop, or learning tip number two, try and keep your learning loops short. If you can shrink the distance between the cause and an effect, that's going to help that knowledge flow from the explicit into the tacit, or from the explicit into the implicit, and implicit into the tacit. It's going to help that stuff become second nature to you. So for instance, how long does your build take? How long do your unit tests take to run? The shorter you can get that loop, the better you're going to be at kind of unconsciously understanding how your software works and what the effects of a change are going to be. How long do your peer reviews take? If your peer reviews take a long time, if you can start shrinking that, you're bringing that cause closer to that effect and you're going to help yourself start understanding how those things fit together. You can try quick design things like katas. That'll help you because those things are designed to have very quick feedback. It's interesting to note, especially if you're working in something with Kanban, limiting your work in progress actually keeps your loop shorter by default. The fewer things you have going on, the shorter your loops are going to be. So kind of buried in this cake are four types of learning that are going on. We have explicit memory and implicit memory. And then we have myelination, and then we have these cool things called neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. They're very big words, don't worry about it. We'll get to each of them in turn. And the first we're gonna talk about is explicit memory. Explicit memory is the memory we're all very familiar with. It's the memory you can recall, it's your first birthday if you can remember it, or you know, the first birthday you can remember. It's that time at Christmas you got that really cool toy and everything was great and you remember it. And we've got two different types of explicit memory. Semantic, which is when somebody tells us something, like I'm telling you right now, that's gonna go in your brain and become an explicit memory. And then we have episodic memory, which on the other hand is a direct experience. So it is the difference between someone telling you bears are dangerous and having a direct experience that bears are very dangerous. This is an example, bears don't actually attack people all that often. <laughs> have to be the bear advocate here. The cool thing about your explicit memory is you can actually map it. They do tests and have done tests in terms of how certain uh, concepts are associated with each other in your brain, your response time after being primed by particular things. And you can map this whole semantic web of your brain. So you can show that like person is related to organism, which starts down here, a plant organ, an artifact, into structure. And up this way, you get into the various animals. You've got different sorts of thing groups over here. Like, I don't know why they call that rodeo. That's very strange to me, but it's an event. Point is, is that this is a thing that we can actually map and track. That leads us to tip number three. You want to try and keep an open mind and explore. And you want to try and be surprised. Your brain loves being surprised because that's really, things that surprise you thing, are things you're going to remember. Try and set up experiments. We talked a little bit about that in the double loop learning stuff, but you can try forming hypotheses about why something is the way it is and then go try and disprove them. Try and give yourself time to go on explorative tangents. Take some time and just go find out about something interesting or not interesting, something that maybe you think might help you later. Budget that time for curiosity. 
That's very, very important. All of these things build that semantic web help you find relationships between things that you didn't know that there might be, help you find ways to map knowledge into your brain. Because the bigger that semantic web is, the more your brain has a place to go, oh, well, that's like this other thing, and it's like this thing too, because that's how your brain works. It's a giant symbol machine. Implicit memory, on the other hand, is the memory that's hiding inside of you. We have general implicit memory, which in this case, if you encounter something labeled murder-free alley and some things that say, come on in with a giant smiley face, you're going to feel uncertain about that because we've encountered a lot of things in the culture, in our lives, that make us uncomfortable about that. Why would they need to advertise that it is a murder-free alley? That seems weird. The other type of implicit memory is procedural memory, which is like that riding a bike. It's actions that we're doing that are inside of us, that, that very tacit knowledge stuff. That can help us with number four. As we're building this implicit memory, as we are getting more comfortable with scenarios, we can look out for guided learning. Because guided learning is going to help us exploit this thing called the zone of proximal development, which is a fantastic term. But all that really means is that we have the ability to do these things unaided. And we have these things we can't do. And kind of in between those, we have things that we could do if we had a little bit of guidance. And the more you push that boundary, the bigger your implicit memory gets about a situation. The more comfortable you are with various situations and various uh, abnormalities that might occur, you know, various errors or exceptions or you know, whatever it is in the particular language of choice you're using. You could do this by finding a mentor, or, you know, getting a digital mental, like plural site, et cetera, or Buying a mentor, actually straight up telling somebody, hey, I'll pay you money if you'll come help me. Listening to other people helps build that implicit memory. Not engaging in conversation necessarily, but actively listening and trying to gain knowledge from their experiences too. Because we as humans can communicate with each other. And that helps us learn from other people's failure without having to go through that failure ourselves, which I think you'll all agree is ideal. You can try watching other people's PRs, paying attention to those, or having group PRs. This is a way to build this collective shared agreement of what is good and what is not. It's a cultural building example. And above all, just try and be mindful and listen to that implicit memory. Pay attention to when it's telling you something. Can I fit that there? I can. Awesome. The third type of learning is this thing called myelination, which sounds, I don't know why. I've been looking at the word too long. I have no idea how it even sounds anymore. But the point is that your brain is made up of these neurons. And these neurons have dendrites up here and the nucleus here. And they've got this long strand called the axon. And then down here, they've got the axon ending and the synapses. When your brain signals something. When you decide to do something, your brain's making signals or a tiger jumps out at you, your neurons start firing energy at each other. And that energy comes in through the dendrites and shoots down the axon and out through the synapse to other neurons. I mean, if you've done work with a neural network, that's literally what it's patterned off of. Thing is, is that it takes time for signals to go down that axon. I mean, they're moving at the speed of light, more or less, but not quite, because there's still resistance in that. There's things that have to go on. It's this weird biochemical process. Myelin is a protein which wraps itself around the axon. It looks like a little string, string of sausages. And this, that actually lets the electricity, the signal, hop faster down the axon. It means that your nerves actually fire faster. It means you're more responsive which is really cool because myelination does not just happen in the brain. It happens along the entire central nervous system. So when you get better at a sport, when you get better at something physical, what's literally happening is myelin is wrapping, sheathing your axons, sheathing those nerves, causing them to literally fire faster than they did before. It's kind of a whole body learning. Last thing, the last kind of learning, are these two things called neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. We used to think that the brain didn't generate new nerves. I remember my mom telling me, don't bang your head against walls, or don't, you know, if you ever get in a car accident, or you shouldn't drink, because that kills brain cells, you don't generate any more of those. Now I can tell my mother, 
No, actually, we do generate brain cells constantly, so I think I'll have the whiskey. Thank you. <laughs> but what's happening in your brain is you're, when it detects that it's sending a lot of blood to a particular neuron or a particular area in the brain, it says, oh, crap. I need to actually work harder at this. And it will start generating new neurons at that location. It will literally make areas of your brain denser. And then on the other hand, if you don't use an area, it will start to cull it. It will reduce the number of neurons in that brain section. That's neurogenesis. The other one is when your, your synapses start firing with each other, when they start interacting, if they're firing in sync, the bond between them gets tightened. Your brain literally connects them. It's called uh, dendritic learning. And this is a way that, or excuse me, synaptic learning, excuse me. Uh, synaptic learning means that your brain is just wiring these things together. If these two things happen at the same time, I'm going to start associating those two closer together. I'm going to tie those neurons more, connect, more, more connectedly with each other. And if they fire out of sync, I'm going to wire them apart because obviously those two things don't need to worry with each other. Now, there's actually a new paper that came out that argues that there is dendritic learning instead of synaptic learning, which is an, in, like I said, I read boring stuff so you don't have to. But the evidence for it is not 100% there yet. So I don't have to change this part of the presentation yet. So you might be asking yourself, I introduced noodles at the first part. Where is he? He's kind of hiding here in this implicit and tacit stuff. Because, as you may have noticed, a lot of this stuff that's implicit, a lot of this stuff that's tacit, that's system one learning for you. It's unconscious. You're not consciously learning those things. You may be consciously practicing those things, but you're not consciously learning them. Like, for instance, your password. You're doing that a lot, but you're not sitting down and going, okay, we're going to move that into tacit knowledge. That's your body doing it all on its own. But on the other hand, almost all learning requires us to use system two at some point, requires us to consciously practice, requires us to consciously gather expli or, uh, explicit knowledge that we can then fold into that implicit knowledge. And you can see that because if, for instance, take the example earlier. If you are driving to work and you're in that space where you're off in your head and system one is driving, you've just basically said, noodles, take the wheel, go ahead. And then Noodle sees something that he's really unprepared for, like, you know, an alien coming out of nowhere. Noodles doesn't know how to handle that, and he will freak out, and he'll just go, nope, this is system two. And whatever you're thinking about, you'll suddenly get called back into that space. You'll get called back into the moment. Because you're, you have to consciously deal with novelty. Novelty re-engages system two. And when we're learning, we encounter novelty a lot. On top of that, if we're doing intentional learning or dedicated practice, if you're a fan of Andre Ehrlichson who wrote the book Peak, that usually requires us evaluating our own success in a conscious manner. It requires us saying, was this good? Was this bad? How did this work? So I'm talking about this like it's a problem. So why is it a problem? Well, all right. If learning almost always involves system two in some way, then I have to talk to you about this concept called cognitive ease. Cognitive ease basically is a thing that our brain seeks constantly. When we feel like we're not working hard in our head, we're at cognitive ease. When somebody gives us a math problem to do, you start to feel what's called cognitive load. And so cognitive ease is just the absence of cognitive load. But when we rely on system one instead of system two, we feel that cognitive ease. We don't feel like we're working because it, in a sense, is not the conscious part of our brain doing that effort. But if learning involves system two and when we rely on system one, we feel cognitive ease, then feeling cognitive ease means we're at risk of not learning. And like I said, we actively seek cognitive ease. Noodles really wants us to not spend a lot of time and effort on things because that's part of his job is to save us time and energy. Like, if we're given the choice between math and cake, noodles really want you to pick cake. And then I go and choose math, and noodles is very angry. 
So what do we do about that? Well, there's a really simple thing you can do. You can burn your comfort zone. Salt the ground so that nothing ever grows again. That's simple, right? No, okay, let me dial it back. What you wanna be doing is chasing the right kinds of effort and discomfort. You wanna be finding the places that your brain hurts. And to do that, you have to kind of know what mental effort feels like for you. You probably already do. You just haven't thought about it in those terms. I know that I feel it, it's like my head starts to fog, my brain starts to feel literally full, and it's like, nope, I just, I need to take a time, you know, take a break. Because the best thing is once you feel that, once you know what that mental effort feels like and you feel it, you rest, reset, and repeat. You come back around and you say, okay, I'm gonna switch my context. Like for instance, going on a walk, even just going to the bathroom can help you break that context, reset yourself, and then get you in the mood for the next phase of learning. And then you sit back down and you do it again. You try and understand again, you get to the point where you feel that effort again, and you reset. And you just repeat this. It's like weightlifting for your brain. Almost literally, in the case of something like myo you know, myelin, or in the case of the neurogenesis and neuropl neuroplasticity. Try and catch yourself feeling, or excuse me, taking that easy way out. If you catch yourself going, well, I don't, I don't want to think about that right now. I'm just going to do this because I know it will probably work, and then if this breaks, I'll come back to it later. Catch yourself in those moments. You don't have to go down and chase that right, chase down the rabbit hole immediately, but at least know that you're consciously making the decision to take the easy way out. So I hope, because you're here at a conference, that I don't have to convince you, because it makes me really sad if I have to convince you why this is a good thing, why you want to be pushing yourself and learning constantly. But if I do, here's some good reasons. Number one, comfort zone breeds holy wars. How many people are made uncomfortable by this? Got one person who's honest. How about this? How many people are uncomfortable on this? A lot more hands, that's what I expected. This discomfort that you're feeling leads to the holy wars that we have in our developer community. <laughs> and it happens because Noodles really does not understand the difference between familiarity, truth, and goodness. He thinks they're all the same thing. When we feel something is familiar, it is obviously good. Obviously, it's the right way. Obviously, it's the true thing. Just because I know all of the key bindings for Emacs, including the foot pedal. Obviously, why would I use anything else? It's the perfect tool for me. That familiarity is the trap. That's the thing that gets us. Being able and willing to take that easy way out to run with that familiarity and just say, well, this is the way that I do things now and not challenge ourselves is the thing that brings us to these holy wars. Once we become invested in that, once we become a Vim developer or a Java, a Vim user, or a Java developer, or you know, a TDD advocate, we want to avoid that loss of admitting we were wrong. We invest in that. Noodles really hates admitting we're wrong. It's this thing called loss aversion that your brain has. You can look up and it's really terrifying. We just don't like admitting we're wrong. We don't like mistakes. We don't like admitting that we spent, you know, all of that time learning those key bindings and the foot pedal and we bought the foot pedal and we didn't even need it. Because we could have just used VI and not understand how to quit. But that's the kind of stuff that we need to be on the lookout for. We need to be pushing ourselves. Reason number two is we want to try and escape these local maxima. If you're not a huge math nerd like I am, remember functions, functions from you know, middle school or high school. Function is a thing, you've got the y and variable, the result and the x, and this is a curve, yay. A local maxima is if we take this visible range, we say we can only see this part, this is the local maximum. But that's obviously not the highest point on this function highest points up over here, but we can only see this bit. We want to try and push ourselves out of these things, even though we have to go down in order to go back up. If you do like, you know, machine learning and stuff like that, you're very familiar with this problem. There are these things called J curves, and they show up everywhere in economics, and they're 
Basically, at some point when you make a change, or like for instance, switching to a new technique, the output drops. Your efficiency will drop. There's this initial decline, but over the long term, you'll have this improvement. And so what you want to be doing here is try and sense and destroy that fear of loss and change. When you feel that initial sense of loss, your immediate gut reaction is to turn around and say, well, that didn't work. I'm going back to the really familiar thing. But you have to give it time to play out. Now, obviously, there's realistic things in there, like can I actually spend the time, et cetera. Those are harder decisions that you have to make. But in general, you want to try and destroy that fear of loss. Take the time to learn shortcuts in your, you know, whatever IDE or application you're using to develop. Try out the command line, maybe. For instance, in Git, things like that. Try and automate things. Take the time to automate yourself out of these things that you're spending a lot of time in. Yes, that takes time, but in the long run, it saves you a lot. The lastly, the biggest thing you can do here is just ask why something is the way it is. That will help shock you out of the ruts, shock you out of the comfort that you're in. Reason number three is actually neuroplasticity and neurogenesis in and of itself. Because this becomes really important as we start to age. It turns out that learning things enables us to be able to keep learning things and helps us avoid degeneration that sometimes gets associated with old age. It's kind of that keeping your brain fresh thing. When they talk about those things like luminosity or like the brain training apps that were popular back in the 2000s, like you know the, whatever the one was on the DS, um, those don't help you in the long run. What they really help you with is in the short term because your brain is learning something new. That learning something new is really what drives that neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. Doing the same thing over and over again just means that you're pushing things into that implicit tacit knowledge. Tip number seven is try and use as many parts of the brain as you can while learning. The more you can engage the entire part of your brain, or not the entire part, but larger parts of it, the more things are gonna be connected for you, the better you'll remember stuff, and the better you're gonna make connections in other situations. Try handwriting your notes, for instance. That kinesthetic experience can help you remember stuff and can help you connect dots. It also forces you to slow down. Try drawing it out, sketching your notes instead of just writing them. Try printing it out and shuffling things around. Experience different ways of interacting with that knowledge, interacting with those things. Fidgeting and moving. You may have noticed I fidget like crazy up here. I tend to move often, but that, again, that kinesthetic experience helps me work, helps me more of my brain be engaged at a given point in time. Try using brainstorming techniques that involve varied types of input. You know, thinking about things. If you can associate stuff with, for instance, smells, et cetera, that also helps. Your uh, smell is one of the senses that's most directly connected to memory, actually. Um, so a particular smell will pull you right back into a place in time. You'll note that I did not say you should, you know, walk up and smell your coworkers or lick them. Um, that's on your comfort level with your particular workplace, but. Try and just engage those things, engage those various parts of your brain as you're working through stuff. Don't just sit there and type in the code and look at the code, you know. We're very visual as a, as a, uh, uh, almost said species, but that's, that's probably a little weird. Uh, as a profession, there we go. Reason number four for trying to grow is growth as a person and as a developer. When we talked about that particular semantic web, when we talked about growing it, it works for your particular, our job, for what we do. Whether you're a developer or not, the more we have a tightly knit and wide semantic web, the better off we are because we have more experience, we have more things that we can tie to each other. And as we grow our experiences, even in things that are not developed or in development land, we realize that lessons can really just be learned anywhere, especially outside of software or even outside. Things that I've learned from woodworking, things that I've learned from you know, reading obscure books on psychology, things that I've learned from gardening have all found their way 
in one way or another, as a metaphor or as an explicit piece of knowledge that I've learned or something tacit that's just at the back of my brain that I can't really explain, but it tells me that this thing is better than this other thing. All of those things feed back. And so broadening our experiences, our scope of experiences, helps us become better people just in general, let alone better developers. The last tip that I want to talk about, though, is teach others what you've learned, or at least talk with other people about it. Because this is really, it, you have no idea how much you will learn if you start trying to do this. Because someone will ask a question and you'll say, I don't know, now I have to do that. Part of the reason why I try and give talks and continue to give talks is I learn so much preparing them. Because I have to ask myself, well, what if an audit presence member asks about this? What if they ask about that? Suddenly I'm three books deep, like footnotes everywhere, and then, you know, it's time to mow the lawn and I'm, it's this high, it's, it's bad. But that depth of learning only really comes when we have that external knowledge. If I'm not being forced to explain it to somebody, I will read through a book and I won't chase into the footnotes. I won't go look and say, well, why is that true? Why is that other thing true? Because it's more comfortable to just read a book and then go, cool, that was nice, and put it aside. But you can try writing a blog post about it or giving a talk about it, even if it's just a lightning talk to coworkers. Um, I know people who actually get accepted for talks and then go and write it. They, they get accepted for something to force themselves to learn it. Uh, which I consider to be terrifying, but that's me. And you can also try what's called a rubber duck or cardboard cutout debugging. That's from an apocryphal story way, way back in the day in the hacker jargon, their jargon dictionary for the hacker stuff, um, about a manager who had a taxidermy duck on his desk, and he got so sick of people coming in, junior developers coming in and talking to him and trying to ask them about, you know, ask him a question and answering their own question in the course of explaining it that he turned around and said, well, you, before you can talk to me, you have to tell your problem to the duck. And you would be really, really shocked how often this works. It helps to have something, you know, to talk to, uh, whether it's a duck or something Lego in your cube or whatever. Um, <clears throat> there was somebody on, uh, I think it was the Pragmatic Program, who talked about a cardboard cutout that they had of Uma Thurman in his office that he used. And he said, you would be amazed how good she was at debugging things. <laughs> but forcing that, your brain to reinterpret things, and again, use different parts of your brain, you're moving from this conceptual portions of your brain all in the, into the left half of your brain, which is where all of the language stuff lives. You're forcing it to reinterpret stuff. And you will make connections as you do that that you didn't when you were thinking about things over here. Last reason why you want to be doing this is there's just too much frickin' information out there now. Eddie Obang has a really cool talk, a TED talk, about the world after midnight, where he talks about the rate of change, the rate of growth in the things we have to know is so huge now that it's above the human capacity for being able to learn all of it. So we have to be good at learning, and we have to know what it is we have to learn, and we can't keep up otherwise. Like, I, like they said in my intro, uh, I, there's probably been at least three JavaScript frameworks released in the time of this talk. That's conservative. So let's sum up. I've gone through a lot of stuff. But we learn through a bunch of different processes, almost all of which involve that conscious, logical self, system two. And we can tell that we're actually learning by noting that we feel cognitive effort. And that means we want to burn that comfort zone. We want to keep pushing ourselves to be uncomfortable, not in any inappropriate or ways that are going to actually harm us. It's worth noting that you might not have the mental capacity to do this. You know, for instance, if your spouse has been diagnosed with an illness, et cetera, you're probably not going to do this, and that's okay. Not everybody can do this all the time. Just putting it out there is a not a maxim, not something we have to do, but a way that we want to try to live. Chasing that effort keeps us pushing forward and learning. We want to try and seek that novelty, that change, because that's going to keep us engaged in that process. And the surprises are going to keep us remembering what's going on. We want to expose ourselves to as many viewpoints as we can, because that helps build that semantic web. And we want to be open to being surprised, putting ourselves into situations where we might be surprised not always looking into the comfortable, the familiar. 
We want to try and use as many parts of the brain as we can when we're learning, using multiple senses. We want to tell other people what we've learned. And we want to try and consciously evaluate our theories of action in that double loop style. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for having me. The slides are going to be up at this bit.ly, and I hope you learned something. We're doing Q&A now? Yeah, Q&A. I'm going to give the mic. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll come find you. And you can speak into this microphone. Hello. Great talk. Thank you. Could you describe the word that we use, intuition, in terms that you just described here? Yeah. Intuition is that tacit knowledge coming forward that something that we can't really describe, it might be implicit, might be tacit, somewhere in those two, coming forward, it's that system one coming forward and saying, no, this is the right way to do things. So it's knowledge that used to be explicit, or it might be something procedural in the case of like the, the bicycle, et cetera. But that knowledge that we've learned turns into intuition for us. Even if we're not consciously thinking through the steps to get to that place, that System two, or system, yeah, noodles coming through, system one and saying, hey, look, no, that's the right way to do things. That's that intuition coming out. And if you think about it, actually, intuition is very, very important. Um, and there's a whole different talk I give on, on creativity and uh, what they call incubation, which is if you tend to walk, or if you encounter a problem, most of the time it's system one that solves it. Uh, we kind of backfill with system two after the fact, but think about like all of the moments you've had uh, realizations of something, like how to solve something in the shower. That's because we're bored in the shower. And when you're bored, system one starts rooting around and going, well, what do I have laying around? Oh, here's the answer to that problem. So it's that, in, that tacit knowledge, that implicit knowledge, is what you're describing as intuition. So, <laughs> so you mentioned the confirmation bias, um, which is a way that intuition can get you into trouble. Yes. What would be maybe a really important little uh, aphorism or something we can take with us to keep our intuition here and valuable, but not let it get us to, into too much trouble? Um, I'm going to say Read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, that's the first one I can tell you, because that actually is a whole book on kind of when that intuition is valid and when it's not. Uh, in a more realistic, practical example, try proving yourself wrong periodically go back and revisit those things and go, well, is this still true? Is this thing true? Like, for instance, I know developers who are still down on Java as being really clunky and slow, and it's like, have you used Java since 1.5? Like, there are whole languages built on top of the JVM. It's phenomenally fast now. Argument about verbosity aside. But revisiting, reevaluating those things and not going with the comfortable intuition answer all the time is the way you kind of get around that, and trying to disprove it instead of proving it. Does that help? Yeah. Any other questions? So is repetition the key to tacit learning? Uh, Can you repeat so that? the question was, is repetition the key to tacit learning? The answer is pretty much. Uh, doing something over and over is what literally starts triggering, the more you activate those neurons, basically, is the way that that myelination happens, the way that that neurogenesis and neuroplasticity happens. All of those are triggered by what's called activation, uh, Laura, I've forgotten the word, activation triggers, basically. The more that those things fire together, that's what's going to cause that learning. And that is the process that leads to that movement into the, ta the implicit and tacit knowledge. So doing something frequently helps us move that knowledge in. Um, getting it back out again is hard, but does that answer your question? Yeah. I got one more over here. Did you hand draw all those slides? The question was, did I hand draw all the slides? The answer is yes. I'm crazy, so <laughs> thank you. One more? Uh, so the question was, 
Yeah, talking about the J curve, uh, and there's that initial hit where you take initial hit to your efficiency or output or whatever. Um, and the question was, how do you, what's the calculus is what he exactly said, to figure out whether you should go with something tried or true or try and experience something new. Um, the answer I will give is from a manager's point of view, which I'm not, but have been previously. I was saved. Uh, <laughs> The answer is really dependent on external factors. Um, if you can have budgeted the time to do the experiment, if you give yourself a scoped experiment, like time boxing is a thing that I've heard described a lot, where it's, okay, I'm gonna try this for X period of time, and I know that I have the time to do that because we built that into the schedule. That helps you explore those things while not necessarily going down the rabbit hole of as developers, or as anybody really, we get sunk into that, that sunk cost fallacy of, well, now I've tried this, I really should make this work, and suddenly it's four weeks later and we have nothing to show for it. Um, I know that it's kind of a, trying to get that buy-in at the higher level can be hard, because the, the emphasis on productivity is often very high. Uh, trying to make the case for exploring those things, leading to greater productivity, or finding the ways that we can be better is, with reasonable managers, not hard. Uh, but in the, some cases, not always possible. So the externalities of that situation are really what kind of drive that for me anyway. Um, I know people who are very vehemently one way or the other, but that's kind of a personal choice for them. Um, I, but as an example, uh, we embarked, that was like four years ago now, my company on, we were revamping a pr uh, project and they gave them two weeks because one, the lead developer was really into Dart at the time and is still, which is very weird, but uh, he thought that that was great and so they gave him two weeks to basically go, okay, see what you can get up and running in Dart because we've never worked with it before. And at the end of it, they said, okay, now we're going back to JavaScript. So there's kind of a, like I said, building that structure into your working, you know, the way you work is essential to trying to get that time and give yourself the ability to make those choices, to explore that J-curve. Because not all of them are going to come back up. Uh, uh, so the question was, have I looked into state-dependent memory and is it true or false? Um, I have looked into it a little. It's definitely a thing that is, I mean, it's definitely a thing that exists in the sense that if you're in a state, especially an emotional state, you remember things better that were in other emotional states. Um, there's all kinds of cognitive biases that float in and around that. Like for instance, uh, I talk a lot about mental health actually. Um, and things like depression, et cetera, are a situation where it's when you're depressed, you tend to remember the times you were depressed previously. And it's also really hard to envision a future where you're not depressed, which just re-emphasizes the whole situation. Um, I don't know, I don't know of any studies as far as the I remember people in college who would drink a lot while they were studying and then go to the test bombed because they were arguing that state dependent memory would help them. I'm not sure how well that worked out for them, but <laughs> Yeah, that was their theory. I think they just wanted to drink in the day, but um, I do know that stuff like, for instance, like I said, uh, smell is very connected to your sense of memory. Smell is a great way to help recall stuff like that. And it is, for instance, I've had, you'll notice this even with friends, et cetera. Um, you'll get into a car, you'll be having a conversation, you'll get out of the car to go eat lunch or whatever, have a different conversation, get back in the car, and suddenly pick up the conversation you were having in the car it, that's that sense-dependent memory kind of coming back out. It's just, it's less sense-dependent and a lot of context as well, so. So Albert Einstein said he hated exercise. So what, you know, later research said exercise is important to learn. Mm -hmm. What have you found? Um, well, I know exercise is important to me. It doesn't look like it, but uh, it's important to me for just a, a mental state. It helps me not deal with some of my mental problems or not experience the symptoms as bad for some of my mental problems. Um, to me, it is also a great way to context switch, to get out of my head, to be doing something else, you know, uh, exploring something, like letting my brain just kind of churn on problems while I'm just focusing on, you know, the running, on the lifting, et cetera. Um, I don't know in terms of, I mean, Einstein's always a weird, uh, character as far as some of that stuff. I mean, there are always exceptions, but in, 
in general, I tend to think of it as kind of essential for keeping me creative, keeping me, it, exercise also helps me sleep. Sleep is super important to the rest of it, so. That was a non-answer to your question, sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you.